Welcome to Japan Expert Insights and our Japanese Politics 101 room. Every Sunday, Timothy Langley, Chief Executive Officer of Langley Squire, a Tokyo-based public affairs consultancy, and host Maya Matsuoka, bring to you the latest developments in Japanese politics. In this podcast, we welcome comments, questions, and opinions. So if you haven't done so yet, join us next time. In the meantime, you can find us at japanexpertinsights.com and our YouTube channel, where we upload all the conversations on Japanese politics, business insights, and the Japan's role in the Indo-Pacific region. Good morning and welcome to this uh, 41st edition of Japanese Politics 101 Room with Timothy Langley, uh, who's got uh, his own company in uh, downtown Tokyo. The company focuses on government and public affairs, and Timothy Langley has been here in Japan for uh, collectively for 40 years. He's uh, one of the very few foreigners uh, who does this uh, kind of work here in Japan. And we have uh, the pleasure to have him here every Sunday morning at 8.30 so that he can tell us what uh, happens in Japanese politics. Timothy, there is a lot happening right now. Uh, we just uh, talked with you about uh, six points which you're going to tell us about today. So let's start. Great, thank you very much. And thank you always for the great introduction, Maya. This is our 41st um, uh, consecutive Sunday together. I'm really grateful for that. And I'm grateful for the audience that collects every time we get together. Today's November 21st. I am calling in my report from the red brick warehouse in Yokohama, <clears throat> where there is a car event where I'm sitting in the back seat of my car so that we can have this briefing and then I can participate in this, this event that I've, I've been uh, co-organizing. I'd like to talk about what happened this last week. We have a weekly briefing. Every, something happens every week, and it's always important, and it's always um, uh, you know, uh, somewhat critical to talk about it. So I'd like to talk about what happened this week. We talked, uh, we'll talk about the supplementary budget that was passed on Thursday. That was the reason for having the diet session in the first place and why the prime minister called the, the, um, uh, the parliament back into, um, into a very brief um, meeting. Um, I'd like to talk about the opposition leadership. The largest opposition party is going through a bit of a soul-searching effort because of um, the, the, the poor showing that they had in the election. So their leader gave up the, uh, the leadership and they're going through this, um, who's going to be the next leader. I'd like to talk a little bit about coalition building among the LDP-like um, parties. That's the LDP, um, Komeito, Komeito is kind of not LDP-like, but they are in a coalition with the with the LDP. Um, Ishin, which did extremely well in the election, and the uh, Democratic People's Party. There's there's stuff bubbling there that's very important. I'd like to um, talk a little bit about geopoli geopolitics. Usually, this is the um, uh, the ballywick of Dr. Stephen Nagy. He speaks twice a month um, uh, on uh, Japan Expert Insights. He speaks on Monday nights. It's not this Monday night. His turn is next Monday night. And, um, but I'm going to be talking about some of that because there have been some developments. I'm going to talk a little bit about the travel and quarantine uh, um, relaxations and the movement of the, um, the administration towards opening the country. As we all predicted, um, as soon as the election got over, we held the diet. We talked about the supplementary budget, and then these things would start to fall into place. And then finally, as a wrap up to today's briefing, I'd like to talk about the LDP and what has happened within the LDP as a consequence of the election. And they're pretty big, it's a pretty big deal because if you're talking about Japanese politics, you, you must talk about the LDP. It is the, the biggest bear in the room um, and it defines and, and guides what policies and, and politics and money, um, everything within uh, Japanese, uh, the Japanese political sphere. So I want to talk about what transitions have been made as a consequence of that. And that will probably be the beef of today's briefing. So let's get right to it. Yes. The supplementary, are you okay? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So this, the supplementary budget was passed. It is huge. It is massive. It's, it's generating a lot of um, interest, obviously, but a lot of criticism too, that um, it is potentially so huge only to be like a flash in the pan to generate public um, appreciation or public interest in what's going on with the budget it is that huge but at the same time you know in in reaction to you know the 18 months that we've had with covid restrictions and the the punch that it's had to the the economy here um maybe it is 
uh, justified. I think uh, only time will tell. But the, the, the amount of money that is being dedicated to the economy is really uh, noteworthy. Um, part of that is devoted to um, getting families with kids a little bit of relief. So this has been the big controversy over the last two weeks. We talked a bit about it last week with Komeito proposing uh, to have um, uh, 100,000 yen given to families with children to help ease them and to kind of generate a little bit of a boost to the economy. That, that was accepted by the LDP with certain caveats, and those caveats became a little bit clearer as we got closer to this um, diet session that we just finished. And the way it was uh, originally planned and the way that it rolls out now, the differences are maybe not that important to, to people in this room, but just for purposes of, of um, you know, clarity. Um, every family who makes, uh, initially who made, there, at first there was no um, means testing. Everybody gets it if you have children. And then the LDP said, no, it's too much of a lean on the economy. Let's means test it. They came up with anybody, anybody who re um, receives less than 9.6 million a year is eligible for that, for children, for every child under 18. And then they modified that further this last week so that there might be a, a two um, income family. So um, any family who has uh, mother and father working there and it's um, their uh, salary is, combined salary is less than um, uh, 15 million per year qualify. So basically that encapsulates 90%, 93% of the entire population dual income under 15 million, that just about captures everybody with young kids. Um, so the, they've done that, it comes in two tranches. One tranche is cash, the other is in coupons. It will come out in February or March. It is a big hit to the economy. And part of the criticism is that it's not gonna do anything for the economy. It's not going to encourage people to travel more. It's maybe going to encourage them to save the money a little bit. Um, it's not going to be spent on on travel or entertainment or so it's it's something like you know uh, I think it's gosh I, I think you could probably say it's it was generated by Komeito to develop an appreciation for Komeito looking out for families and and the downtrodden and the underclass and the middle class that sort of thing in anticipation of the upper house elections which will be in the early summer of next year so that's really breathing down. Um, down uh, politicians' necks, and, and you'll see that in, in some of the other comments that are coming up. Um, there will be a, a lot of money spent on the COVID response, getting companies back on their feet, um, giving them or allowing them to have uh, easier money for loans and uh, business expansion. Um, the economic kick that this is supposed to provide is being uh, heavily managed and monitored by the you know the economic revitalization team, um, which has got a, a new minister there. The supply chain will receive a lot of interest as will semiconductors um, and um, uh, the, um, what is it? Just the, um, the, the standardization of getting the economy back on track. So that's mostly what this uh, supplemental budget is um, devoted to. The supplemental budget kicks in in April and it goes to the rest of the year. So it, it's not, you're not going to see it right now, but since the budget has been approved, uh, people in the ministries will know that that's coming down the path. Um, it's kind of like when you see uh, us getting towards the close of the year, all of the roads start getting worked on. They have to spend that money. You'll still see that happening here with, within uh, many of the ministries, but they see that the, the wind is coming to fill the sails. So there'll be um, some upkick in, um, in, uh, in the economy with hospitals. Hospitals will be getting a lot more attention here for dealing with a COVID, um, not trying to eliminate it completely. Um, so if there's other interest in the supplementary budget, maybe we can talk about that in our Q&A. Moving on, the opposition leadership, as you know, the um, Constitutional Democratic Party, the largest uh, opposition party in the diet, uh, suffered pretty poorly um, because of the elections. They went from 110 members to 96 members. It's it's not a huge loss, but it is it is um, you know a loss of you know a, a significant number. And as a consequence of that, their leader, Mr. Edano, 
um, decided that he would uh, resign as leader. And now they're going through this soul searching. They've got four candidates in order to be a candidate for um, president of this political party. You need 20 signatures. Uh, they have four candidates that satisfied that two of them just squeaking by getting their candidates. So um, there's a lot of interest now. It'll probably be decided within the next uh, week who will be the new leader of that. And the reason why Ad Mr. Adeno resigned was his strategy on defeating the LDP during this last election basically failed. Leg one of that strategy was that uh, we have to criticize the LDP because only by highlighting what they are doing wrong can we shine as you know an alternative to what they're doing. And the second reason is because he decided to form something of a, a coalition, not a true coalition, but something of a coalition with another opposition party, unfortunately, the Japanese Communist Party, so that um, in election districts where the Communist Party doesn't have a candidate, the Japanese Communist Party would convince it, their voters to vote for the uh, C, C, the Constitutional Democratic Party candidate. And alternatively, in those areas where the um, uh, Constitutional Democratic Party did not have a candidate, they would convince or lobby their members to vote for the Japanese Communist Party in that district. And that just didn't go over. People felt um, uh, browbeat or um, pressured to vote for somebody that they didn't care about, they don't know, their interests uh, don't uh, align with them, and so it didn't quite work out. So as a, as a result of that, Mr. Adano um, resigned, and they're going through that soul-searching right now. We'll know something about that. In a different kind of um, game, not with an opposition party, but with an LDP faction, something of the same thing is going on with the Ishihara faction. Um, the Ishihara faction um, went from, I don't know, maybe um, uh, 12 members down to seven. And even the leader, Mr. Ishihara, lost his uh, seat in, in the last election. So that faction is going through the same sort of, sort of soul searching, although it is a faction that's within the LDP. Um, we're gonna talk just a tiny bit about that towards the end. But it looks like it it, it might just uh, dissolve, actually. The, the members, the seven remaining members, might look for a, a better home to, um, to reside in. Um, moving on, I'd like to talk about a coalition building that's going on within the LDP, Komeito, Ishin, who did it incredibly well. They went from 10 members to like 41 members in this last election. Um, they are the biggest, proportionally the biggest winner of this, this last election. They did incredibly well, surprised everybody. And um, they're forming something of a, a friendship with the uh, Democratic People's Party, which is a, a small uh, political party. But in, in, in a combined group, they do exceed the minimum numbers of members that you need to submit a bill into the diet. So previously, they had too few to even think of that. They would have to join with another like-minded uh, party or initiative or Benkyokai to submit a bill and they, they just haven't been able to do that. But now in coalition with this uh, rather small People's Democratic Party, they can. But the idea that they espouse, there, there's a couple that they're, they're talking about. One is constitutional reform. One is the amount of money that diet members get, we need to cut that down. And they also expose, did you know that diet members get a million yen a month for um, for travel expenses, which is not required to be represented by receipts when you get that money. So people, a lot of people didn't know that. They're flagging that to people's attention and they're saying this should be um, revised, this should be reviewed. The members of the parliament have that much free money available to them. If, if the public knew about that, oh my God. So they're, they're creating a bit of a, of a, a controversy there. So they're, they're building these, these webs of, of common interest, and it is being picked up by the LDP. Mr. Motegi has said, indeed, um, you know, constitutional revision. We now have, uh, in coalition with Komeito, Ishin wants to revise the constitution. They've, they've convinced the Democratic People's Party that it's a good idea. We have more than two thirds in the upper house and the lower house to, to begin that discussion. So I'm making a claim for that. I'm going to set up an, a new uh, uh, committee that committee is going to be called the, instead of the headquarters for the promotion of the realization of the constitutional reform, 
we're going to now call it the Realization of Constitutional Reform Committee, and I'm going to be the president of it. That's a pretty big deal. That's a pretty big statement. I don't know if, if even Mr. Abe said something as strong as that when he was prime minister. I mean, he did talk about revising the Constitution, but this is a, a pretty big deal. So this is something definitely to keep your eye on. It's something that will um, be um, developing as, um, as, as we move towards the election of the, uh, the upper house in about six months, seven months. Um, this will be an a increasingly big um, topic of conversation. So be aware of that, stand by for that. Um, moving swiftly forward, I'd like to talk about geopolitics. You know, uh, President Biden, met with uh, Z virtually over um, uh, a secured uh, video link uh, this this week. Um, some good things happened. The fact that they're they're talking and they're kind of drawing the lines and trying to be uh, friendly did create some some traction. It highlighted some some tensions there. Um, Mr. Biden frequently gets caught in stepping on his words or being a little bit unclear or, or changing his mind or uh, that happened again, too, about, uh, you know, the one China policy. So the United States uh, standard policy is it's a one China policy. We agree to that. So that that's why China and, and the United States could continue this very rich um, trade um, relationship they've had because the United States has said, yes, we agree that at some point in time, the two Chinas should be reunited. That's about as far as they've, they've made it. There's been some controversy because uh, China has been very aggressive about establishing or reestablishing, not even reestablishing because it never was. China, Taiwan was never a part of, of uh, the, the communist um, China regime. So it's this um, uh, desire for China to weave Taiwan into the fold. Um, and the United States has said, um, if China, if Taiwan is attacked, uh, we will defend it. And, the, and Japan has also said that. So in these conversations that uh, have been going on, um, there is a lot of uh, consternation, particularly among the Chinese, because they want a free hand. It's also kind of placing Japan in a, a, a kind of a strange position because Japan almost is like a spectator country. It doesn't have the, the uh, military throwaway to protect its islands. It should, but I think uh, compared to if, if China wants to to move on Taiwan, it could do that, and it could also threaten um, Japan. And were it not for the United States uh, nuclear umbrella and uh, um, the agreement between the two countries for um, joint protection, um, it would be a, a very different story altogether. So in order to change that, part one is increasing the defense budget, which is being considered now going from the self-imposed 1% of, of GDP committed to self-defense um, militarization um, to 2%, uh, potentially to include offensive capabilities. That offensive capabilities language is um, not uh, allowed under the current Japanese constitution. So that's one of the reasons why there's such a push for a constitutional revision. And I think everybody on this call understands that. So we don't need to go into it too much. But at the same time, <clears throat> and I'm sure Dr. Nagy's going to get into this in his call next Monday night, um, but the Japan, US and South Korea had talks uh, at the um, vice minister level in Washington DC last week, talking about uh, North Korea, talking about Myanmar, talking about China, talking about all of these things, the trade between uh, Japan and China, I'm sorry, uh, Japan and South Korea, um, and the United States wanting this relationship between China, uh, South Korea and Japan to be more robust and to be, you know, they're, they're electing a, a new president too. So there's hope that um, this animosity that is just right under the surface there begins to um, subside. And the United, it is in the United States interest to, to ensure that that happens. Well, it didn't quite work because the, they had their, their three-way talks, everything looked fine. There was a couple of comments about the, um, the island that they're, um, having a little bit of difficulty with for a long time, Takashima, also known as Dokyo uh, in, in uh, South Korea. And as a consequence, the three-way um, uh, news briefing, the um, uh, Q&A that they were going to have, fell apart and it looked like the United States was the only one doing the briefing. That's not so great. Um, 
there are a lot of other things going on between these three countries. Important among them are what, what are we going to do with Myanmar? Uh, there was a little bit of progress made with the release of a, of a U.S. journalist last week uh, through the good offices of the Japan Foundation and uh, their leader there. There's been um, some joint exercises with uh, Japanese submarines and the U.S. Uh, Navy, which is something of a first. And um, for most people who don't know that, um, Japan, uh, people know that Japan was a superlative uh, naval force during World War II and even before World War II. Um, they have pride and in, in history and tradition in the Japanese Navy. <clears throat> and since the end of the war, that has been hampered somewhat. But what they have focused on is submarine, submarine warfare. And the Japanese uh, are, are one of the best in the world at that. The, the Japan seaside uh, between um, the west, west coast of, of Japan and uh, the rest of Asia is the most tr heavily traveled submarine uh, lane in the world. And so the joint exercises uh, with the United States and the Japanese is something as a, um, a noteworthy thing. The Japanese, uh, I'm sorry, the German um, destroyer visited uh, Japan last week. You're going to see a lot of that in anticipation of this rising tension between China and uh, the rest of the world. Um, and then finally, um, uh, Gen Nakatani was uh, a, a new appointed minister uh, by Mr. Kishida. He, his um, his um, portfolio is on human rights and basically his uh, the tip of his spear is pointed at uh, China's uh, human rights violations and using that as a tool for eliminating trade or trade preferences and that sort of thing. So that's starting to, to get a little bit of traction to there. That was in the news. Watch out for that and also watch uh, Mr. Nakatani. He is a, a very influential, uh, well-seasoned politician. He used to be a um, minister of defense and in the Kishida faction, I think he will continue to play a, um, a very important role. Moving on to travel and quarantine restrictions and they, their relaxation, I'm sure everybody has known and heard about you know, we're going to move from the 10 day quarantine to three days. It's not really a 10 day to the three day. It's still a 10 day quarantine, but we're going to allow you to do three days of quarantine if you submit documentation and jump through hoops and that sort of thing. So it's received a lot of uh, press coverage. People thought that maybe it was actually if you're coming in as a business traveler, um, you don't need to satisfy the 10 day quarantine. You can do three day quarantine and then you're you're free and you can, you can go to your your meetings. It's not quite like that. Um, if you do jump through all the hoops and you get all of the approvals and you have people who are responsible for monitoring you, you can quarantine for three days, actually four days because the first day in country doesn't count. Um, and then after that, go to appointed briefings and meetings that your company has supported for you. These applications need to be, uh, they're, they're, uh, uh, it's a lot of paperwork. They need to be mailed in um, and it, requires uh, approvals from several ministries, all under the auspices of the foreign ministry, because foreign ministry is the ministry in charge of immigration. Um, and it's, it, it takes three weeks for you to go through this process. Um, the news now, it's huge news that they will accept, starting from Monday, this submission of documents um, digitally by, by email. So that's a, a huge step forward. Um, my tongue is firmly planted in my cheek. <laughs> um, the um, the um, focus on trying to get back on track is focused on students, technical interns, and business people. That's the first kind of wave that they'll they'll be allowing in. And you might not know this, but the reason why so few people are able to come into the country is not because the um, uh, the facilities in the airports is not able to accommodate them. It's because they've set a numerical limit throughout the entire country. 3,500 people only can come into Japan from outside. That is, that is really, really a small number. Um, they're going to increase that to 5,000, which is, um, which is good. Um, but if you're a student and you've been waiting to come to your, your, uh, Japanese program because you've received a, uh, maybe um, a scholarship or you've actually entered and gone through the application process and you're entering as a student or as an exchange student, there are more than uh, 300,000 people who are in that 
queue waiting to come in. So even if um, all of the um, people who are allowed to come into the country are all students, it's going to take a long time before they all can come in and, and start their studies. But it's also technical interns as well. And of course, you know, the, the, the big, I think the, the, the real impact is the business people, Japanese um, representing their countries uh, or their companies abroad, coming back in to report to the headquarters and um, get back out and uh, represent their, their companies in the foreign uh, regions. You know, these guys really need to come in and, um, uh, you know, get, get back with their bosses and their colleagues. And similarly, foreign national, foreign capital companies who have their executives coming and going all the time. Um, we can begin looking forward to that. And I think as we get towards February, I don't know about before the end of the year, but I think we'll see some, some transition. It will be rapid, um, but it's, it's just going to be slow and then it'll pick up speed. And hopefully if there's not a, a sixth wave in February, as they are, as some people are predicting, uh, we'll, we could be back to normal in March or April. So I'm very much looking forward to that. <clears throat> um, let me see where we are. I think um, I'd like to move on to my final point, which is um, talking about the LDP. We just finished this election with Mr. Kishida. Uh, Mr. Kishida won as prime minister. He represents the fourth largest faction within the LDP. There are seven factions in the LDP. And um, what I'd like to talk about right now is what happened within the LDP, the factions of the LDP. How was how were things adjusted? Who became a little bit more powerful as a consequence of that and who lost out? So I'll try and zip through this very quickly because most people already understand um, the basics of that. But the LDP only lost 15 seats in this last election. And so they have currently 263 seats in the 464 seat or 465 seat lower house. They also have 109 seats in the upper house. So collectively, they have uh, 372 people just in the LDP. They're in a coalition with um, Komeito. So in the lower house, they are just um, under a, uh, a super majority. Um, but there are other uh, people who are also trying to revise the constitution so they can get a super majority very easily. And I think there's a lot of movement underfoot to do that. There are also um, 70 unaffiliated um, members of the LDP who are, are unaffiliated with different factions. And there's always a race, who's on top, who's the bigger faction, who's, who's on the bottom, and th that competition. So these 70 unaffiliated um, faction, unaffiliated with faction members of the LDP are always closely watched and um, courted. Uh, Sanai Takeichi, who was one of the candidates with uh, Konotaro and uh, Kishida for prime minister, she is one of those unaffiliated LDP members. Um, very close to Mr. Abe, he's the one that supported her because of his support. She became one of the most prominent candidates for uh, prime minister, but she's not in the Abe faction. Let's talk about the Abe faction. Uh, the Abe faction is by far the largest of the seven factions. It has 93 members. And because the um, previous leader of the um, Sewa Kai Kenkyu Kai um, became the Speaker of the House just last week, uh, Mr. Abe became the leader of the uh, what was kind of called the Hosoda faction. So it is now the um, informal name is going to be the uh, the Abe faction, but it is the Sewa Sewa. Sewakai Kenkyukai um, in, in formal names. So in order to get money from the government because you have a political um, party and a political faction, it's represented and they uh, submit to uh, certain regulations, they get funds from the government. So uh, informally, it is called the Abe faction. Most of the factions are called the name informally of the, the chief leader, and that's how I will refer to them now. So the Abe faction, it's produced, you know, three uh, four, four uh, prime ministers. Um, it's uh, got four members of the, the cabinet. Now it has uh, trade, it has defense, it has uh, the chief cabinet secretary, and it has education. 
um, members from the Abe faction. So that's that's pretty good. That's four members there. Um, it looks like um, it is going to begin to increase in membership. Um, several since the election, several members who were unaffiliated have joined different factions, and some um, uh, unaffiliated political parties have also joined the LDP. So there's a little bit of of um, movement going on there. But in any event, we've got the Abe faction is number one, and um, it is expected to continue to uh, wield considerable weight and um, direction within the cabinet, particularly in those areas where it has uh, ministerial portfolios. The second is Mr. Aso. Uh, Shikokai is the formal name of his faction. He has uh, 53 members. Um, and uh, the important part there is that, you know, Mr. Amari was um, one of the prominent members of the Aso faction. Also, Kono Taro is uh, a member of that faction. It's interesting to note that the Aso faction was uh, initially started by Kono Taro's father, Yohei. Um, so this, this um, fixation we have on Kono Taro is not um, unjustified. His father started the, the second largest faction in um, the LDP. Um, he's not the leader of that. It looks like um, Mr. Asa will continue to be the leader. And maybe even uh, Mr. Amari uh, succeeds uh, Mr. Asa. But at some point in time, uh, Konotaro is going to be a major force to contend with. Um, this faction has uh, three, I'm sorry, four um, ministerial portfolios. It has Minister of Finance, uh, Taro. Uh, Aso Taro's younger brother, or his brother-in-law, actually. He, um, they have the digital agency, they have the economic revitalization, and um, they have Kono Taro, who is running PR for the LDP. Not quite a cabinet post, not quite one of the four juicy LDP posts, but uh, a consolation prize nonetheless. The third largest is the Takeshita faction. It's got 53, just a, a, a breath away from the Aso faction. Um, the, the interesting thing about the Takeshita faction is that the leader um, died just before the election of the uh, prime minister, as you might. And um, the head of that faction now is going to be Mr. Motegi, um, which is an interesting uh, choice. Um, so the Heisei Kenkyukai, it is uh, one of the most prominent uh, of the factions. Uh, it produced uh, Hashimoto Yutaro and Obuchi as prime minister. As a consequence of the election, it lost two members, but with Motegi as the titular head, and there'll be a vote, um, I think, coming up this week to to um, certify that he is the head of that. But that gives him a lot of power as, as the secretary general of the LDP and as a faction head. That's how people become prime minister in this country. So um, currently, uh, they have uh, four portfolios. They have justice, reconstruction public safety, and uh, not quite a, a formal cabinet uh, position, but it is it is in the cabinet, the 2025 Osaka Keisa, uh, uh, Kansai Expo uh, minister. Going down the list, uh, the Nikai faction which was very powerful. Mr. Nikai was very powerful um, before this election. It has 44 members. It lost three as a consequence of the election. Actually, it lost 10 members in the election, but seven of its candidates won in the election. And so uh, it only diminished by three. Um, you might remember Prime Minister Nakasone. He's the one that founded this one. They have two cabinet posts, not very many. Um, they have the environment and economic security. They are a faction that is um, kind of headed to trouble because, um, because of Mr. Nikai and because of the controversy that he was involved in and the fact that Aso Abe and Amadi were able to get Mr. Kishida uh, elected. And this brouhaha with Nikai and Suga has kind of run its course. And now Suga is kind of out and Nikai is kind of out. And that's how this shakes out. Uh, the fifth largest is the Kishida faction. They've got 42, just two, two away from the Nikai faction. They lost four in the election. Uh, Kochikai is the formal name of, of his uh, political faction. The main thing that he has going for him is um, Foreign Minister Hayashi Yoshimitsu, a good friend of his. He's probably number two of the uh, of the faction, uh, very popular, 
in an election district where Mr. Uh, Abe and Mr. Uh, Kishi also um, run. And um, it's, it's, it's really interesting because the, the election district that, that Mr. Abe is in, Mr. Abe's brother, the defense minister, Mr. Kishi is in, and the election district that Mr. Hayashi is in, it's the same district. And through um, uh, redistricting, four members will fall to three members. And so somebody has to give up uh, the vote there. And so this, this fight between Mr. Abe, former prime minister, and Mr. Hayashi, current foreign minister, is uh, going to be a heated battle. That election, that, that, that crossing of swords will happen uh, just before the upper house election. So that's, that's months away and you'll be seeing this controversy uh, begin to flare up and people you know, drawing lines in the sand and you know, saying you know, things or having other people say things about the other person that's not very flattering. This is gonna be a big fight, so stay tuned for that. Um, the Kishida faction has uh, three, in, including the prime minister's um, uh, position. They have internal affairs, they have agriculture, and they have the uh, vaccine ministry. Let me see, we've got two more factions. We've got the Ishiba faction. You remember Mr. Ishiba? He wanted to become prime minister. In fact, he wanted to become prime minister four times and lost all four attempts. Um, so he doesn't have any cabinet posts. Nobody returns his phone calls. Uh, he's got uh, 12 members. Everybody's looking for some other place that's going to appreciate their their votes a little bit more and maybe give them a cabinet uh, position. Um, it is a it is a faction that's looking for a way out. And finally, we have the Ishihada faction who has seven members currently. Mr. Ishi, Ishihada, the leader of, of that faction, lost his election. Um, uh, these seven members now are in the process of, are we gonna elect a leader? Does somebody have the, the, the strength of personality to actually continue to hold us together as a faction? Or do, do we have a better chance, maybe two or three of us going together and, and joining the Kishida faction or the Abe faction, might we get a, a better chance? And frequently in Japanese politics, you don't. You just, you're looked at as um, not, not a turncoat or as a traitor, but you're just, you're looking as, looked at as an opportunist. Um, so uh, their, their choices are very narrow and uh, not very attractive, but it's something to watch what's going on with um, the Ishihada faction in particular. The Ishiba faction is less clear. He's not the leader anymore. He is the titular head. They haven't elected another leader. They probably won't out of respect for him, but that's another uh, faction. 12 members um, could be a, an attractive um, uh, rating spot. So those are the kinds of things that we should look at. And the reason why I've spent so much time on the LDP, and I apologize, I've been going on now for um, almost 40 minutes, uh, is that uh, Japanese politics, you can't really study and, and analyze Japanese politics without a good, firm understanding of the LDP. So I hope that that was not too much. I'd like to uh, conclude my comments and open the floor up. Thank you for being so patient. Maya, thank you. Thank you for the preparation, for, um, well, the details as well. The floor is open now. Uh, we invite uh, everybody who wants to comment or have questions to Timothy to join us here. And in the meantime, Timothy, I have a question or maybe two to you. I'll try to keep them as short as possible. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Well, before the election, uh, well, this, it was due to uh, Mr. Suga's uh, policy uh, in dealing with uh, the COVID situation here, also the Olympics. Um, so there was, uh, let's say, a disillusionment among the general public uh, with the policies of LDP. And um, still, uh, you know, the general perception... Seems so long ago now, doesn't it? Yes, it does. It and does seem like a long time ago. Indeed. And it's been just two months or so, right? Mm -hmm. But, uh, well, so, and there was a widespread perception of dissatisfaction, uh, you know, with the policies of LDP. And still LDP, the party won, right? Uh, well, the sole majority in uh, the lower house. So my question is, how come? What happened? Or why does it happen? Yes. Well, we had this discussion before the election. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we talked about was the number of people who show up. So if, if um, like 40% show up for the election, it generally benefits the LDP. The more people that show up, 
the more um, votes typically go to the LDP. And um, that's not what happened. It, it didn't rain that day, but it was a very low voter turnout, and still the LDP did particularly well. Um, they didn't do great, but they, they didn't get their butts kicked, as a lot of people uh, predicted they would. Um, so it's, it's very curious um, why these things happen. A lot of people who are following it and, and making these predictions, very few actually predicted about Ishin, Ishin doing so well. But as far as the LDP is concerned, I think just the the texture of Japanese society and, and culture here, everybody loves to stick with a winner. Nobody likes to gamble. Um, people really don't even go so much for the underdog here. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I keep scratching my head trying to figure that out. But I think, I think the LDP is just, you know, it's been uh, the leader for so long and no other... Um, alternative has produced a viable leadership portfolio. We tried it once. It was a disaster. We don't want to do that again. And leadership requires, you know, experience and skill and, um, uh, you know, having done it before and suffered the results of, of failures. And I think the LDP is, is that body. The general population would like to have a valid opposition party. They don't consider the Constitutional Democratic Party to be that force. Uh, yet, um, but they have um, stated in uh, survey after survey that they would like to have a more dynamic and more robust uh, political um, dynamic of opposition and leaders, so that the the leaders the uh, leadership can be challenged effectively and other policies can be um, brought to the diet floor. And another thing is that I I read somewhere that um, well the new cabinet secretaries. Um, or are they called vice ministers uh, who uh, Kishida son, Mr. Kishida actually appointed, they are former bureaucrats. So uh, one of them belongs to the Ministry of Economy, Trade uh, and Industry. Another one be, uh, belongs to the Ministry of Finance. So I wonder how uh, this will affect uh, the synergies between uh, the politicians and Kasumi Gaseki. Great question. So every ministry has um, two vice ministers. One is a vice minister from the bureaucracy, so it is a, um, a bureaucrat. And the other vice minister is elected from, not elected, he's appointed by the prime minister, who is a politician. So they're, they're kind of mirrors. Um, they you know, typically uh, dislike each other because the bureaucrat, of course, he, he grew up in the ministry, he's at the pinnacle of his career, and you got this guy that just comes in because he got elected and uh, the prime minister likes him and he doesn't know crap. And I got to brief him all the time. And he's the one that gets all the limelight. When the microphones come out, he's the one that talks, but I'm the one that knows actually what's going on. So you follow that. So um, these appointments are made um, out of the, uh, the cabinet office. And um, this change occurred over the last 12 years. And uh, being able to make these appointments out of the cabinet office incredibly strengthens the hand of the prime minister, but more more accurately, the, the cabinet office. So this, this power shift from the bureaucrats to the politicians to the prime minister has been a, um, a long, uh, consistent uh, march forward. And um, so I, I think, I, I hope that is responsive to your question. You were wondering how that political dynamic affects um, the power base of the prime minister and if if I didn't effectively respond to that, maybe we can explore it a little bit more. Uh, yes, thank you. I was busy with the back channel, actually. But um, I asked the question because we know that up until Prime Minister Koizumi, uh, well, the the power was held by uh, the bureaucrats uh, in Kasumi the city. Right. And uh, Koizumi, Mr. Koizumi, he actually uh, weakened that power, that grip on yes. the internal policies. And uh, so the poli politicians, they gained from that. Uh, in That's terms right. Of, uh, right. Uh, policies, they could um, actually dic not dictate, but they could uh, more easily work to have their policies and strategies passed. And um, so it increased their power. So that, that's why I wondered, you know, what is going to happen from now on or what are the chances, you know, of uh, going back to pre-Kuizumi? No. So they're yeah, not... Pro probably not. So, 
you know, you know, bureaucracies and, and government, whatever they get, they get a, um, a tax increase or they get some sort of uh, ability to influence something. They never give it up. They, if, if they can grandfather it or if they can continue it, they always do that. And that's the problems with, you know, with modern um, government is that once, once you give uh, a delegation of authority, it, it almost continues until uh, forever. Um, so uh, with, in, in the Japanese scene though, uh, Koizumi, um, he didn't initiate it, but it was a, a critical component of moving this power base because it, it used to be that the bureaucracies just had so much power and, and uh, influence and the politicians had, had so less. And uh, since the politicians are the ones that are um, supposed to be, uh, well, voting, not so much writing the law because even the bureaucrats are writing the law. Um, so the, the, uh, the transition was um, enabled by the cabinet um, office having control of uh, personnel assignments. That's how they did it. Right. So they went from there. So uh, then the, the ship began to the, the politicians and then um, ultimately to the, um, uh, the prime minister's office. Right. I think that, I, I think that will continue actually. I think the, I think um, Japanese politics will continue to evolve so that the prime minister becomes more like a president with more power, more ability to, to um, dictate and define. The, one of the, the problems with Japanese politics is that you had this rotating um, uh, prime minister. Everybody acknowledges that. The Japanese acknowledge that. And they're trying to figure out a way that, that they can have a prime minister who has enough time and experience to, to stabilize you know, and implement his policies. So since it's a, it's a parliamentary democracy, the logistics are a little bit difficult there, but I think they're moving in that direction. I see. It leaves the question about, um, you know, stable policies right. uh, in the long term, open, because we have seen that in some countries when the prime minister or president changes, uh, well, the whole, let's say the bunch of policies change too, uh, which doesn't bode really well with, um, right. let's say, well, with uh, uh, corporations willing to invest there or corporations uh, doing business there. But yes, okay, let's see what happens. So, so just um, speculating a little bit here, the Japanese constitution has been untouched since its creation uh, 65 years ago, 70 years ago. Yeah. It's been untouched. Not a word has been touched. And once uh, part of the fear here is that once they begin to uh, dabble with some of the language, then everything becomes open. And obviously that's, yeah, that's, that's why we want to do it. That's part of it. Right. So yeah. the, the most crying need is probably, I think for some people, um, the self-defense uh, restriction, the peace constitution. But uh, a lot of people say it's not just that it's also the ability of the central government to dictate to the local governments what to do in the event of a, a pandemic, which is what we've, we've gone through right now. So they use current affairs and, and current topics to, as an argument that we need to revisit it. And of the five things that we're going to revisit, 0.5 sub B is, and then they, they slip in the one that they really are interested in. And I think once that process begins, you can anticipate that, uh, sure, in terms of politics, in terms of the power of the, the prime minister, uh, succession, that sort of thing will be addressed. But that's a long road. It needs... The, first of all, there needs to be a crack in the facade and then let water seep in. And pretty soon, just time has its way, 20 years, and, and you could have a completely different country here. Well, thank you for that answer. And we've got Hiroaki. Good morning. Are you there? Your mic is muted. Please unmute. Yes. Hi. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tatimoshi, for your insightful analysis on Japanese domestic politics. Um, I have a question, actually. Um, of course, Japanese domestic political situation affects uh, diplomacy as well. Uh, to, to begin with, uh, sorry to forget about uh, introducing myself. I'm Hiroaki Nakanishi, uh, expert in the defense diplomacy relationships 
uh, especially in the Indo-Pacific affairs. Uh, currently a member of the Liberal Democratic Party of Japan. Uh, just a, a general public, a general member of uh, Liberal Democratic Party, so I don't have any uh, influence to the LDP, actually. <laughs> so, That's uh, okay. Th thank yeah, you for your service. No, it's okay. Yeah, no, just, just as member, so <laughs> I don't have anything to do. Uh, but I have a question. So because many people are wondering about the Japanese uh, future course in the Indo-Pacific, uh, many people uh, speculate about this Kishida's uh, selection of new foreign minister, Hayashi, uh, who is expected uh, expected or sought as a Chinese supporter. Hawk or dove? Uh, oh, yeah, dove uh, as well. Yes, yes. Right. But um, in the Kishida regime, of course, as you know, uh, there are so many, not so many or some sort of people are uh, uh, supporting Taiwan uh, affairs, right? Right. So um, many people are thinking about which, which kind of, I mean, cause Japan, or especially Kishida regime is going forward. Um, so that is the question, because it's also linked with our defense security policies. So I, I would like to ask you about this, like uh, this uh, future course of Japanese defense security diplomacy right. in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, another question is, of course, if you think of LDP, LDP is uh, some scholar uh, see the LDP governance is governed by different political groups you mentioned, like Kishida or uh, Abe, Abe or right. Aso group. So I'm wondering about this, like, uh, how could I express it in Japanese, uh, English, but maybe greater Kochi Kai mm -hmm. initiative? I'm not sure about this, the state, current status of this great uh initiative. It's a link with this, perhaps, breaching the Kishida and Aso group, because uh, they are originally uh, separated from this Kochikai, original Kochikai group. <laughs> right. So uh, I would like to ask you about this. Uh, if, do you have any uh, idea of uh, Am I establishing or emerging big greater Kochikai, and also, um, if possible, like a future prospect of LDP governance for the future <laughs> in general? Thank Gosh, that is my question. Yeah, thank you. Okay, did Maya teach you how to ask questions here? <laughs> <laughs> if I can, <laughs> okay. So, so first, first, let me get to your, your first one about um, uh, Hayashi is he a hawk or is he a dove? Yes, yes, um, yes. And I think a lot of people think that he's a dove because he was the okay. uh, leader of the, um, you know, Japan-China Friendship League. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I don't know if that necessarily – I think he has an affinity for China, and why wouldn't you? It's, you know, it's a great country. It's, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's Japan's largest trading partner. It, yeah, it, yeah. Makes, it makes a certain amount of sense. It doesn't mean that um, everything that they do is something that you agree with. But, but I think even in um, – uh, interviews that he has had, he said, look, you know, even, even the famous general uh, about, you know, knowing your enemy said, you know, in, in, in politics, as in mm -hmm. warfare, you, you should be familiar with yes, uh, yes, your, yes. your enemy yes. as, as you are with, with your friends. And I think yes. that that's, that's a wise observation, but mm -hmm. also whether he's a hawk or a dove or a panda hugger mm -hmm. or not, <laughs> um, you also have other components Mm -hmm. You've got Mr. Uh, Kishi as the defense minister, and then you have yes, Yen yes. Nakatani, mm -hmm. who was just appointed in, in the human rights portfolio. Yes, yes. So th th there is, yeah, and, and I think uh, Nakatani could be uh, uh, considered a hawk. And I think mm -hmm. the, the reason why the LDP wanted to have Hayashi there, even if it's ambivalent, if he's a lover or a hater, is mm -hmm. that the LDP is um, perceived to be too hawkish on China. And it needs mm -hmm. to soften that. It needs to bring that back a little bit because nobody wants a confrontation. And if you look mm -hmm, at any mm -hmm. of the newspaper treatments of that, even even the newspapers are very ambivalent. They're not they're not uh, really staking a claim of Japan should protect uh, Taiwan. Japan should you know nobody's really saying anything that's um, even um, giving guidance to the population. It's all just kind of mealy mouth and just kind of very soft and. Nobody really takes a very hard stand, uh, mm -hmm. whereas in, in China you have different um, uh, press outlets 
that really say some horrible things about Japan and about, you know, how they should reflect about what happened during, um, during the war and how it just, just lots of things like that, that are just unhelpful in, in moving, moving the country forward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, um, the other question, I think it was subpart B of question number three, um, was, well, I forget, what was that about? That was about uh, the LDP. Uh, future course of LDP. Oh, right. Coach yeah. So, so um, yeah, the, the way these factions began and then they split off and then they changed their names, there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of animosity among some of them uh, for, for a lot of different reasons. But, um, yes, the, the current prime minister wants his um, faction to be bigger, stronger, better. And even okay. uh, Mr. Um, uh, Amari uh, Motegi has said he wants to be the next prime minister after Mr. Kishida. Mm -hmm. So already mm -hmm. we, we, you're, you're making these, these plays here. And in order mm -hmm. to become prime minister, you have to horse trade. So yes, maybe uh, you trade with the uh, Abe faction and the, um, the Aso faction so that you, be I mean, that's what mm -hmm. happened with Kishida. Right. It's all about horse trading. Some people retain power. Some people relinquish a little bit of power, but they get some power in another way. That's that's Japanese politics for you. I hope that <laughs> responds somewhat to your question. Thank you. Yeah. Very insightful. Very you should, as well. <laughs> yeah. Listen, you should you should continue to join um, every week because um, I, uh -huh. I've only responded to two of your 13 questions. So please oh, come yeah. back. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, I would like to, of course. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you time. very much. Thank you. Yes, yes. Definitely. That's why I'm here every every week, you know, because you answer only part of my questions. So. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, uh, well, Timothy, I have another question to you. So you talked about uh, the different uh, coalitions between, um, well, the parties in uh, the Diet at the moment, the lower house of the Diet. And just, I wonder, so what are, this is a very specific question. What are the chances of Ishinokai and LDP forming, a, a, let's say, a formal alliance? Because they, obviously some of their, um, let's say, elements, you know, they, they're very similar. So the things they fight for, they want to establish, they want to introduce as policies here. So what are the chances of them becoming, you know, a um, formal alliance? Okay, that's a great question. And I think the way I, I can answer that is by asking um, a kind of unrelated question. But the, the question is, for people who have power, mm -hmm. do they love power and they want more of it? Or are they kind of happy with what they've got as a general rule? Right. And I think the response there is, people who have power, they enjoy it, they love it, they want more of it, they want to have better and bigger, right? Yes. And I think with Ishin, this is, a, this is a tremendous opportunity for them. They have tremendous growth potential because they're basically centered in, in Osaka and in the Kansai. They have, they have um, good leadership here in Tokyo as well, um, but they've got a great opportunity to expand that just based on the notoriety of what they were able to establish in this this last election so i think it is highly likely um it could be something like a coalition uh as with komeito komeito is very different from the L far more different from the ldp than ishin is to the ldp right so if that statement is accurate then the opportunity for a coalition um with um with the ldp is that much more attractive? So I hope that responds uh, somewhat to the question. But I think it's a, it's a, it's a great thing to dwell on, and you can be sure that people in the LDP and in Ishin are also talking about that too. Indeed, yes. Well, it answered my question. Thank you very much for that, Chris. Yes. Uh, hi. Um, my question regards the uh, comment we just heard about uh, a uh, Japan-China friendship alliance, and it. Uh, sparks me to ask, ask a longer term question of all things about Osaka 2025 and whether or not having a, uh, a World's Fair in Japan is, is an opportunity for greater collaboration for the Pacific Rim and all the things that people do that are about building, building uh, positive uh, efforts and, and not about uh, killing each other. Thank you. 
<laughs> Why take all the fun out of it? <laughs> okay. Um, well, I think that Timothy is just a, a little bit busy right now moving his car. Uh, but we have a room, uh, Japan Expert Insights uh, has a room on geopolitics uh, in the Indo-Pacific. And that room is uh, led by uh, Stephen Nagy, who is a fellow at the Christian University here in, in Tokyo. And he talks about these uh, topics um, every second week. So not tomorrow, but in a week from tomorrow, we are going to have him again. So the room opens at 8 o'clock in well, Japanese time in, at night. If your schedule allows to do that, please join us at that time. So, Timothy, can you can you talk now? Yes. Um, yeah. Sorry, I was distracted there. Um, all of these require, you know, in-depth knowledge and knowledge that I don't have that Nagy has out the wazoo. So it's always a great room. He has great um, uh, a great audience, a lot of people who are, uh, you know, people who belong to the think tanks and also to various um bureaucracies in the in the subject countries that he's he's talking about so um a great dialogue yes and his stance about your question uh, chris is uh, that basically japan and the other countries in the indo-pacific region are trying to engage china in other ways not the military way so that um, basically they engage uh, uh, with china via trade economic ties as well so that uh, these uh, relations become closer uh, and as the countries become uh, more involved in them, uh, you know, the chances of a military conflict with China uh, diminish. But of course, um, we have seen that the region has been militarizing and uh, Stephen Nagy believes that this trend will continue. But uh, at the same time, uh, the trend, you know, of uh, having the countries here working closer with China and uh, well, with China to uh, strengthen economic ties with it uh, will continue as well. So, and oh, he also says that uh, basically Japan is one of the leaders in this direction uh, and uh, Japan's vision about uh, engaging China as uh, a partner, not as an adversary, here is very strong too. Yes, um, there has been a lot of posturing uh, on uh, both sides. I mean, uh, the Chinese side and also the side of the United States and the uh, well, countries in the European Union, but, um, well, Stephen Nagy also says that uh, most of that rhetoric on the side of China is oriented to its domestic public. And, uh, well, we're going to see what happens, but uh, that's what, uh, well, the common, uh, the consensus in that room is at the moment. That's, yeah, that's right. Great, great observation there. Thank, thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you um, a week and a day from now in Dr. Negi's room. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, that we have exhausted the questions for today. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. <laughs> well, next time I'll prepare 10 more for you. <laughs> okay. So listen, if you're interested in, in more detail, I have um, uh, newsletters on my webpage or on LinkedIn please reach out, um, you know, establish a relationship uh, with me so that you can follow these things. Um, and please join us every week. This is a great, a great community. This is our 41st uh, consecutive Sunday together. And uh, the, the dialogue just continues to grow. And I think it's a, it's an important, um, an important thing to examine Japanese politics on a, on a weekly basis. And I appreciate everybody's interest in it as well. Thank you very much for setting up this, this room for us, Maya. Okay. Sorry, just la last question. Uh, I would like to ask, I mean, many media are now talking about Jap whether Japan should participate in the Beijing Winter Olympic. So, yes, great yes. question. So, yeah, I cannot miss this question because this is very much linked with so, the situation. So if you have an op yeah, opinion on this, then a comment, I highly appreciate. Yeah, I, I don't have an opinion, but, um, you know, uh, Biden spoke with... Z uh, on Thursday, and there, there was a, a, a story that was leaked out that the United States was considering withholding, sending um, athletes to the Olympics. That's a huge deal. And it turned mm -hmm. out that it, it was, I don't know if it's fake news or if it was just leaked out as a kind of a, a, a saber rattling, you know, because the telephone conversation didn't go very well, or because the, the Chinese are placing so much of their prestige on mm -hmm. having this this event um but what the united states does i think 
um, Japan will do in lockstep. I think that there will be coordination there. Um, I'm I'm not in a position to evaluate one way or the other what what the um, countries should do, but I mm-hmm. just know that it's a very very delicate um, mm-hmm. diplomatic um, opportunity. It's also mm-hmm. a challenge for us, um, yeah. and it's just around the corner. It's, it's mm-hmm. yes yes it's months away. So um, yes, if if people are going to tweak somebody's nose, and this is the way to do it, yeah, it's going to be happening. Um, very rapidly athletes are in place and i think that the you know the chinese are not going to do anything uh, any more aggressively to um generate that kind of animosity globally mm-hmm. they'll mm-hmm. wait until after the olympics is my prediction oh, okay good good thank you um because the media media of course uh, this morning uh, news show also high, foreign minister hayashi uh <laughs> appear on the tv show of course, yeah. he consider uh, just um, the participation in the Oli- Beijing Winter Olympic uh, from the perspective of our national interest. So, <laughs> so just his answer is just you know considering. <laughs> yeah. Any so op- op- options. Yeah. My my advice, Hiroaki, is continue to be doing your push-ups. Mm-hmm. <laughs> push-up. Yeah. Um, con- uh, yeah. My continue actually, your uh, training. Yeah. 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 Too. Actually, uh, this is my very personal opinion. Um, uh, Japan, if if possible, Japan, uh, it is better to participate uh, the Beijing Olympic. <laughs> oh sure, uh, be, uh, be be seeking the bridge builder. But uh, if nothing uh, things appear, I mean, seems to be appear, uh, you know, any uh, breakthrough. Then, uh, of course, they, uh, it doesn't make sense. So, but uh, this is my personal opinion. Japan should seek some uh, uh, options, like as a bridge builder, as much yeah. as possible, uh, to you know, uh, also establish something good channel with China through yeah. the foreign minister Hayashi. Um, uh, oh, oh, my opinion, uh, if possible, yeah, Japan, it is good if uh, Japanese high official Kishida or Hayashi participate in the Beijing Olympic meet. Uh, Xi, Xi Jinping is very good <laughs> uh, to uh, discuss some issues or relationship between U.S. and China, how make stable, I mean, the relationship U.S.-China stable, but also talking about some guard or, uh, opinion or uh, initiative of guard, some guardrail measures. Uh, making stable the relationship, um, and it, of course, the making stable in the Pacific. I mean, the also order as well. <laughs> this is my personal opinion, but <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Please join us next week, too. Thank you, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for giving me a chance to talk <laughs> about this. Thank you. Yes, we just got a, um, a message from Tomoko, and uh, she's uh, she commented, you know, that uh, well, the United States is considering a diplomatic boycott of the Olympics and probably, you know, uh, the United Kingdom may follow suit. So what does it mean? Right. I, I think if, if it goes that direction, um, the reason <clears throat> is not just because of Taiwan. I think it would be because of the pandemic. I think that would be the, the reasoning uh, behind that. Um, so there's still so much information that is not really clear. Mm-hmm. Uh, diplomatically, it doesn't look like, other than uh, yeah, I guess the road, road and bridge, Belt and Road, and a, a lot of the initiatives they're, they're taking does put other countries on edge. I just don't know if it equals, um, you know, withdrawal from uh, the Olympics. That would be a huge uh, slap in the face, but maybe that's the message that they're trying to deliver. I don't know. But I think it would have to be something a little bit more substantial than, than that. And I think that the, the biggest thing out there would be, you know, the, the COVID outbreak. Well, thank you very much again, Timothy. And Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Maya, for hosting this room. We'll see you next week then. Great. Looking forward to it. And thank you. Thank event. you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. This was Japan Expert Insights Room on Japanese politics. Thank you for coming and staying with us today. We will be on air next Sunday at 8.30 in the morning, Japan time again. So join us. Until then, you can find us at japanexpertinsights.com and our YouTube channel, where we upload all the conversations on Japanese politics, business insights, and the role of Japan in the Indo-Pacific region. 
if you want to stay informed about our upcoming events, you can follow us on Clubhouse, LinkedIn and Facebook. Again, we're looking forward to your joining us next week. Until then, stay well and enjoy every day as much as possible. See you.